the M. Stan and Evans Symposium on Money, Politics, and the Media is held each year by Troy University's Hall School of Journalism and Communication. The 2016 speaker is Pulitzer Prize winner Hank Klimanoff, co-author of The Race Beat, The Press, The Civil Rights Struggle, and The Awakening of a Nation. Welcoming attendees is the director of the Hall School, Dr. Jeff Spurlock. Good morning and welcome to the 2016 M. Stanton Evans Journalism Symposium, hosted by the Hall School of Journalism and Communication here at Troy University. Hi, I'm Jeff Spurlock, I'm the director of the Hall School, and it is a joy to have all of you joining us with us today. I want to recognize Mr. Steve Stewart, under whose leadership and guidance has orchestrated this event. So Steve, thank you so much. Also, I wish to thank Dr. Larry Blocker, who's the Dean of the College of Communication and Fine Arts, his secretary, Rhonda Taylor, our secretary, Kate Rowinski from the Hall School, as well as the entire faculty, staff, and you, the students of the Hall School who have made this event a success. The symposium for years has been named in honor and now in memory of noted author, journalist, and scholar M. Stanton Evans, more affectionately known as Stan. Stan served on the Hall School's faculty for over 20 years until his passing last year at the age of 80. He certainly is missed and it is fitting that we continue his legacy with this annual symposium. It is now indeed my pleasure to call upon someone who really does not need an introduction here on the Troy campus. He's a friend to us all. Please welcome the Chancellor of Troy University, Dr. Jack Hawkins. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spurlock. What a pleasure it is for me to, to be here this morning. Uh, and I would say to uh, the keynote speaker, uh, Hank uh, Klibanoff, uh, welcome to Troy. I, I, I told him when we introduced the, to ourselves to each other that I felt like I, I know him and have known him for years because his sister Judy uh, and his brother-in-law, Ron Engel, have been friends for a long, long time. In fact, Dr. Ron Engel was the president of Coastal Carolina did an outstanding job there for many years. And so it's a pleasure for me to, to welcome Hank here. And, and to Steve Stewart, uh, I met Steve about 25 years ago and he was actively engaged in the newspaper business then. And we were delighted uh, when Knox Spurlock was able to recruit him to Troy and, uh, and he brought his practical skills here. And I would say to you, uh, uh, congratulations on your involvement with the Hall School of Journalism and with your commitment to communications in general. Uh, I think one of the marks of a, an educated person is the ability to communicate. And certainly uh, that transcends verbal communications. It includes writing. And, and I can tell you from the standpoint of someone who interviews a lot of recent college graduates, uh, you want to make sure that you have strong communication skills as you uh, prepare yourself for the job force because uh, that that skill, being able to write and to verbally communicate, uh, will help you go a long way, and it'll also restrict your professional growth. I commend the, uh, the Hall School for the topics today uh, that focus not only on journalism and communications, but also on civil rights. That's a, a subject uh, that cuts to the heart of, uh, of the commitment at Troy University. and. Uh, some of you may know the name John Lewis, Representative John Lewis, who is an icon in the civil rights movement, uh, oftentimes refers to himself as the Troy boy because he came from Pike County, was born in nearby Brundage, and has been a friend of this institution and indeed has an honorary doctorate from Troy. Uh, one time, Representative Lewis said, as he talked about the civil rights movement, he said the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings had it not been for the news media. Uh, and so the, telling the story can be just as important as the story itself. Otherwise, uh, it's akin to the tree falling in the forest. Did it actually fall if it was not seen or heard? Uh, indeed it did, but it has a much greater effect when you tell that story. And so civil rights uh, has been at the core of uh, this commitment uh, at this university for many years, manifest probably most appropriately through uh, the Rosa Parks Library and Museum, uh, which is located in Montgomery. How many, have you, how many of you visited the Rosa Parks uh, Library and Museum? Okay, I see uh, just a few hands. Let me encourage all of you 
to make sure that between now and the time you graduate from Troy that you take advantage of uh, that facility. Going through that story, I think, will we'll offer a, a, great, a greater understanding of what has been experienced because as Miss Juanita Abernathy said last Friday night during her keynote uh, address during the African American Leadership Conference, she said, indeed, Alabama may have saved the nation. What a powerful statement. And it began right there in the center of downtown Montgomery when Rosa Parks didn't uh, give up her seat. Years later, and that occurred on December the 1st, 1955, years later during the late 1990s, we worked with Ms. Parks as we planned and built the Rosa Parks Library and Museum. It's located on the very spot where she was arrested in 1955. It offers a, a great and powerful story. I encourage you to take advantage of that as part of your Troy experience. And then the second dimension of this, uh, which will be spoken to, just the whole dimension of journalism. I, I need not say more, but I am very, very proud uh, that the Hall School of Journalism just a few months ago was ranked number six in America. That should offer testimony to all the world that uh, now they know what we have known. And that is, it's, uh, our Hall School is a great source of strength. And I would close with one quick story. Many of you uh, follow the WSFA, the NBC affiliate in, in Montgomery. If you watch early morning news, you uh, often see that great Troy graduate, Tanya Terry. And uh, I remember well, and Tanya graduated about 25 years ago, maybe 23 years ago. And I remember the first day that she uh, uh, presented, appeared on TSU TV, as it was known. And uh, I watched her throughout her collegiate experience. Knew Tanya, she was uh, one of my girls, and she took a job with a TV station down in Dauphin. That was her first assignment. And I went down and spoke to a civic club one day, and Tanya, of course, uh, came out and covered uh, probably not because of what I said, but simply because she knew me. And so she came out, and she was accompanied by a young lady who was carrying the, the camera, the video equipment. I think they all do it with one now. I, I see these reporters coming, and, and they're a lot more efficient in how they do things. And so, uh, but this young lady who was doing the, uh, operating the camera uh, introduced herself, and she said, uh, Dr. Hawkins, if I had it to do over again, I would have gone to Troy. Of course, that made me feel good. I won't tell you where she went because that would be unfair, but she would recognize the institution. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, where did you go? She told me, and I said, well, why would you uh, have gone to Troy given an opportunity to redo what you've done? And she said, if I had gone to Troy, I would be on the other end of this camera because we only studied the theory of broadcast journalism and what you've had the opportunity to do at Troy is to do the practical. You know, when you fly a plane, you need to know the theory of aerodynamics and you need to have sat in that cockpit. Then you have the complete pilot. That's why I'm so confident that uh, the Hall School of Journalism does a great job in preparing tomorrow's journalist. I commend the faculty, staff, and I also want to thank uh, Professor Klibanoff too for loaning us uh, his valuable time Indeed, over time, you'll realize that's one of the most important things and most valuable things any of us have, and it decreases in time. So make sure you use your time wisely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. I want to thank you for the inclusiveness and diversity of Troy University that you emphasize so much. I think we all benefit from that. And uh, I'd like to echo what Dr. Spurlock said, thanking everybody who's helped with this symposium, including the students, faculty, staff, administrators, media, and everybody else. Uh, I want to tell you about one of my favorite characters in the race beat. His name was Bill Crider, C-R-I-D-E-R, -E and he got shot while he was covering a story. The story was the integration of the University of Mississippi. 
1962. There was a riot going on on campus and he was there as a reporter and somebody shot him and knocked him flat on his face. He had pellets in his back and he was bleeding, but he managed to get up. Most of us in that situation probably would have looked for a doctor right away, but he had something more important to do. He looked for a telephone, he called the Associated Press, and he filed his story that he'd been working on that day, and then he sought medical attention. His colleagues were impressed, his colleagues and competitors, the other reporters, and they fed him their notes while he filed his story by telephone with the Associated Press. Bill Kreider was lucky that day in, in comparison to a couple of people who actually got killed at those riots. One of those was a reporter, an international reporter with a French news agency, and another was a civilian. The race beat is full of vivid stories like this. It tells us about journalists and activists and ordinary people who are heroes, villains, and victims. It's an instructive book because it shows us how reporters can and are, can be and are resourceful in using whatever means they can to get and cover the story, how they adapt to emerging technologies of which TV was an emerging technology, TV news was coming of age during this time. But most important, the book tells us about something that never changes about journalism, which is that good journalists don't give up on their mission of finding the truth and telling it. And the book is inspiring, too, because it tells us, it demonstrates that when journalism is done right, it's a powerful force to make people's lives better. The book makes me both proud of being a journalist and aware of the profession's shortcomings then and now. It raises issues that endure today about human rights and journalism. The Race Beat, Hank's book, was designated as our reading initiative this year for the Hall School of Journalism and Communication. And I have used it as a textbook in class and have seen how it enlightens students about uh, journalism and also about segregation and civil rights in recent Alabama and Southern history. One of the people in the book is Grover C. Hall, Jr., who was editor of the Montgomery Advertiser, and he's one of the three Hall journalists for whom our School of Journalism is named. We're delighted today to have Hank Klibanoff as our speaker. Hank was born in North Alabama. He worked as a newspaper man for 36 years, most recently as managing editor for news of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He's now a professor at Emory University in Atlanta, where he guides students in examining unsolved or unpunished racially motivated murders. He and his co-author, Gene Roberts, who's another nationally prominent reporter and editor, they wrote the race beat and won something that all journalists covet, which is a Pulitzer Prize. But um, the prize they won was not the one that a lot of, a lot of good journalists win. There's a bunch of Pulitzer Prizes for journalism every year. But there's also uh, in the category of letters, drama, and music, and their prize was in history under, the, under that category, letters, drama, and music. Hank serves on the Journalism Awards Committee for Columbia University. He serves on the advisory boards of the National Press Foundation, the Rosalind Carter Mental Health Fellowships, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, and an Atlanta nonprofit youth development organization. He formerly was on the board of the Associated Press Managing Editors, and in November he was inducted into the Atlanta Press Club Hall of Fame. Hank, we're looking forward to hearing from you, and we'll be grilling you with some tough journalistic questions. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Steve. I want to thank the university. You're, you're a global force here, and I hope you understand and appreciate that we know that outside Troy. We know that in Atlanta. And so thank you to Chancellor Hawkins and to Dean Blocker and Director Spurlock and of course Professor Stewart for having me here uh, at this uh, lecture that honors uh, Stan Evans. Uh, he was a, he himself was a giant in, in the news field. Uh, he came out of a generation that is not unlike the generation that I write about. It was the generation I write about in the race beat. Uh, editors, the role of editors has changed over time. And he came out of, uh, was engaged in journalism at a time when the top editor of a news organization did not run the news operation. They didn't know what the city desk was doing or 
the business desk or the national desk, or they might pick it up during the course of the day. They were mostly writing editors. They were mostly expressing commentary and opinion. And he was quite a force in that regard, and certainly you know his past in helping found the Young American for Freedom, the American Conservative Union. And uh, over years, that role has changed so that editors today are very rarely do editors write. They manage the newsroom. They might manage news in some cases, but generally they'll relegate that to the managing editor. And often they are dealing with the bigger issues that involve production and circulation and advertising, and they work at that level. Um, if I had, uh, if I could wave a magic wand and find a time when, when journalists really had impact, it would go back to the time of Stan Evans, who did have impact. Um, I am an Alabamian, and, I've, and I love being here. I grew up in Florence. You know, when I was growing up, uh, you know, what was in Florence State Teachers College, now the University of North Alabama, and Troy were very much rivals in, in all levels of athletics. Of course, y'all are now Division 1A, and University of North Alabama is, what, 2A? Or, I think, uh, quite good at 2A, I might add. But, uh, and, uh, but I, I, I do feel the Alabama embrace here, and, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, Chancellor Hawkins mentioned John Lewis. My Lord, I mean, this man is phenomenal. Uh, he is my congressman, and I'm proud to say that he is my congressman. I've had the opportunity to work with him on, a, on some projects and to introduce him, and um, I, there, I, I'm just in awe of him. And as soon as I drove through last night and I saw that sign, Pike County, I thought, my goodness, you know, to think of the history that occurred here just in the life of John Lewis is phenomenal. Um, but if I keep talking about that, I'll never get to my point. So today I do want to try to do two things. Um, I am going to talk about the race beat. Um, I think my publisher always prefers for me to hold it up. I want to, uh, I want to thank you all for adopting it. I mean, that's the warmest embrace I could feel, is to have you adopt it as, as you're reading. Um, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions about it. We're going to discuss it some here today. Uh, I want to discuss, open up with just some history. And, and we're going to talk about the history of the South, the history of Alabama through the race beat, but then I'm going to bring it up to a bit more modern examination that I work with uh, with my students, your contemporaries, your peers, and examining and uncovering some of the harsh realities of the past. And I do not often mince words, okay? I mean, this, we've got a We've got something in the past that we have to deal with, and I'm not going to uh, hedge too many uh, words when it comes to explaining some of that. Um, I sometimes worry that people look upon this as our past, and that they think of, you know, separate water fountains as a past. It was, you know, which I think anyone could look at that and say, oh, come on, so it was a minor inconvenience. What's the big deal? But it was symbolic of something that it's, at its core was much harsher and much more virulent. Certainly you know about the dogs and the hoses that were unleashed just up in Birmingham. And Birmingham wasn't the only place. It happened in Grenada, Mississippi. But even then, some people say, okay, but that was one day. One day in Grenada, one day in Birmingham. How bad is that? Well, let's, let's try to put this in perspective. Excuse me. Everyone knows who this is. This is the face of terrorism, Osama bin Laden. And we know that. We instinctively feel that. It's a visceral feeling the minute we see that. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11. Carlos Jackal. We know these men were terrorists. Do we think of this man as a terrorist? Looks like a nice man. Looks like he probably teaches Sunday school. In fact, I think he did. This is Sam Bowers. He was the head of the Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi. And he ultimately died in prison long, long, long after he had murdered a man, tor tortured a man in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And he was not tried and convicted until decades later. 
who is this? He looks avuncular, looks like he might have coached a, you know, little small, uh, you know, peewee football. This is Bob Chambliss of Birmingham, who loved his nickname, Dynamite Bob, because he loved to make dynamite. And Dynamite Bob Chambliss in 1963 was among the four men who pulled up one night on a Saturday night next to 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham and planted a bomb that of course detonated the next morning and killed four little girls. And it wasn't until 1977, 14 years later, that he was prosecuted. Bobby Frank Cherry, also in that group, it wasn't until the late 90s, 40 some odd years later, that someone finally prosecuted him and convicted him for killing four girls. He walked the streets, he played golf, he did whatever he wanted to do with total impunity all that time. James Ford Seal, probably one you don't know, over in Mississippi, driving through Meadville, Mississippi one day with some other Ku Klux Klansmen. They see a couple of African-American boys on the street. They're both 19 years old. They're hitchhiking, trying to get somewhere. One, one, both were in college. One had what we call a do-rag on his head, and one of the ignorant Ku Klux Klansmen says, Look, he's got that thing on his head. I think that must mean he's a black Muslim, or maybe it's a panther. They didn't know the difference, okay? And they abducted the two men, Henry Hezekiah D. and Charles Moore. They took them out to a, a, a refuge, a, a forest, tied them up to a tree, pulled out these long reeds, and tortured them, just whipped them, beat them till they were all but dead, threw them in the back of a trunk of a car, took them down to the, an offshoot of the Mississippi River, tied one of them to an engine block and the other to railroad ties and threw them in that water still alive. It was not until the 2005, 2006 that because of a journalist's work in uncovering what happened that he was finally convicted and went to jail. So if this is terrorism, we've seen the pictures from Fallujah of American contractors being burned to, to the burned to a char, then hung from a bridge. Isn't this? If this is terrorism in Karachi, Pakistan, a, bo a bomb exploding on a bus, isn't this just up the road in Anniston, Alabama? So I want it to be clear that we had, we're, I'm taking you back to a time when we had terrorism in our own midst. We deal with some of these issues in the race beat, but less from a, a, the political angle and more just from the news coverage angle. Um, and I wanna to try to describe to you the atmosphere that existed in the South during the time that we're uh, writing about in the race beat. This comes from one of, uh, from, uh, well, let me back up and just show you one other uh, thing here. I, if you've read the race beat, you know that we open up with an American dilemma this massive study of race relations. I say to you as students, if you ever want to study the most, the single greatest research that's ever been done into race relations in America, you would pick up this 1,483 page book and read it over the weekend. Uh, written by Gunnar Myrdal on, on the right and Ralph Bunch on the left. They were men of incredibly, of, of, of towering intellect. Um, and, they, and they were trying to probe so many aspects of life in the South, and I think you would be fascinated. One of the people from that era who I'll show you a picture of later, Hazel Brandon Smith, she was an editor from Alabama. She had gone to work in Mississippi. She was, I want you to hear me, she was a segregationist. She did not believe in integration. She did not think it could ever happen, okay? She wasn't an ideologue about it. She just didn't think it would happen. And one day she's walking down the streets of Lexington, Mississippi, and she sees a black man walking with some groceries, and he steps off the curb against, I think, the one light in town. The police chief happens to see him, and the police chief goes after this black man with a billy club and is savagely beating him, and she sees it. 
And she goes back into her newspaper office and she writes a, an editorial. And she doesn't say anything about integration or segregation. She says, we cannot have vigilante justice on the streets. We cannot have people just sort of deciding to enforce their own code, their own law against anybody, and most particularly against African Americans in this town. And her, as a result of her editorials, her building was firebombed and she had to move her newspaper office. Her husband, who was an executive at the local hospital, lost his job. So I want to read to you what she wrote about that time. And I can tell you that this is very much like life was like here in Troy and Alabama and Georgia, up in my area in Florence, throughout the South. She said, today in Mississippi, and this was in the 1950s she was writing, today in Mississippi, we live in an atmosphere of fear. It hangs like a dark cloud over us dominating almost every facet of public and private life. No one speaks freely for fear of being misunderstood. Editors, preachers, teachers, and other professional people are affected by it, as well as business and industry. Almost every man and woman is afraid to try to do anything to promote goodwill and harmony between the races afraid he or she will be taken as a mixer or worse. There were ample comparisons at that time to life in Nazi Germany, to the life that Jews experienced in Germany and that African Americans experienced in the South. And you may think, oh, that's overwrought and overdrawn, and I'll let you study history more to decide if it's true. I just want to show you a series of pictures, nine pictures. Uh, there's a tendency to want to show them fast so you'll get the motion of them. Taken in Little Rock in 1957 when a, an editor of a newspaper in Memphis, the Tri-State Defender, an African-American newspaper, was walking toward Central High School while trying to cover the desegregation of Central High in 1957. This is a man named L. Alex Wilson. He was an upright man. He was a serious man. He could be very dour. He didn't, you know, he was not a jovial, happy man. He was a serious journalist as editor of the Tri-State Defender in Memphis. And he covered Mississippi and he covered Alabama and Arkansas and Tennessee. He had won the equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize and, and on black newspapers, the Wendell Wilkie Award for his coverage of the Korean conflict. And he gets to Little Rock and he's walking towards Central High as a reporter in a suit with a hat on to cover the events at Central High. And he's attacked. They knock, a mob of white men knock him down. He hits the ground, he gets back up. They, they surround him. They close in on him. They hit him in the back like this. They knock him down again. They kick him. Every time they knocked him down, he got up. And every time he got up, he picked up his hat, he creased it, and he put it back on his head, only to be knocked down again. They chased him. They jumped on him. And if you look closely, I might even have a little thing here that allows me. If you look closely, that man's carrying a big old brick that he's about to hit L. Alex Wilson with. So this was not a safe environment for a man of such dignity. He had vowed after once running from the Klan back in Leesburg, Florida, never to run again. And he paid a price. This is in 1957. He, he is so good. And by the way, I just, this may go without saying, but I'm going to say it. He could have been on any newspaper in America. He could have been on the New York Times. He could have been on, you know, the Washington Star then was the bigger paper, later the Washington Post. He could have been on the Los Angeles Times. He makes, he does reach the pinnacle of black journalism. He becomes the editor of the Chicago Defender. So this happens in 1957. By 1960, as a result of the injuries he suffered this day, 
he is dead at age 51. People were under enormous pressure. The, uh, and, and not everyone handled the same. He decided not to run. He decided to take it. Here's Grover C. Hall Jr., after whom this building is named. One of the most fascinating people I had the privilege of researching for my book. He and his father and um, Grover C. Hall Sr. And I'm just going to read you a little bit about it because I just think he's a fascinating guy. Um, and this is also about the Montgomery Advertiser. In its 127 years, the advertiser had periodically taken some progressive, even liberal stands. It had stood forthrightly against succession, secession in 1861, but after the Civil War had become devoted to the cause of white supremacy. It was adamant in its opposition to national prohibition, favoring local option, and dismissed creationism at, while successfully opposing efforts to ban the teaching of evolution. In 1928, Grover, in Grover C. Hall Sr.'s second year as editor, the paper won a Pulitzer Prize for his attacks on the Ku Klux Klan, whom he described as, quote, drill sergeants of hatred, the go-getters of intolerance, the high-powered salesmen of bigotry, aided and abetted by the Machiavellis of politics. In the 1930s, Hall had taken up the cause of the Scottsboro Boys, nine Negroes whom he felt had been falsely accused of raping two white women. Inside the fraternity of editors, his friendships were with liberals. But Hall Sr. died unexpectedly in 1941. They named his son. Six years later, they groomed his son to finally Grover C. Hall Jr. to become the editor of the, of the uh, Montgomery Advertiser. A well-groomed, perpetually tan, lifelong bachelor and bon vivant who seemed quite thrilled by his reputation as a brilliant swashbuckler, Hall Jr. injected vitality into his editorial page. He seemed to enjoy hearing and reading himself argue, which some observers believed masked his insecurity for having never attended college. He spoke and wrote with a flair that matched his natty attire. Hall wore colored dress shirts long before they were fashionable. He favored suspenders and added some spice with a pork pie hat and a carnation in his lapel. He would indicate a coming moment of newsroom informality by carefully rolling up his starched sleeves twice on each forearm, each fold defined by a perfect crease. He was a man of conviction, certainly, but what he thought about things was not nearly so important to him as how well he expressed what he thought. On an impulse, he could crack open some extraordinarily rare and expensive bottles of verbiage. And we discuss how in 19, during the bus boycott, he was very critical of whites. He said, you have brought this on yourselves. He was impressed that the African Americans, led by Dr. King, were, were responding in a professional manner. They were res responding without hysteria. He thought they were, uh, their demands were reasonable, and he very much took that position at that time. At the same time, he was under pressure from advertisers and from the business community of Montgomery. And as we tell the story, he goes to a meeting of the White Citizens Councils in Montgomery and to hear James, Senator James Eastland of Mississippi speak and he just becomes, finds it impossible to resist the temptation to join the segregationist forces. He had been a card-carrying member of the American Civil Liberties Union, generally a liberal, and yet he thought if I'm going to live in this town, I am going to have to be what most people are and what most people expect me to be. And so that's just sort of a flip side of a man like, and, I, and I'm not passing judgment on whether that made him weak or not weak or whatever. I'm just saying that that was the pressure that was on him that Hazel Brandon Smith so well described. This is a picture of Hazel Brandon Smith, by the way, in her newspaper office. So the pressure was on everybody. Now, in a very inartful way, I'm going to transition here a little bit from the journalism to the civil rights cold cases. 
to try to explain to you and give you some more indication of what that time period was like. And I'm going to do it through three or four stories of people that we've been examining at Emory University in the Georgia Civil Rights Cold Cases Project. This is work that's done by my students and, and by me and a, another teacher, uh, professor I teach with, Brett Gadsden. I want to tell you about A.C. Hall. He paid the ultimate price for, well, I'll let you decide what, whether, what he paid the price for. Uh, in 1962, he is at a club in downtown Macon. He uh, plans to meet, a, he's 17 years old. He plans to meet a 15-year-old girl there, Eloise Franklin. They're there, it's, there's, it's not an alcohol place, it's not dancing, they're just people, teens meet, okay? And he's walking her home, they live not far from each other, and he's gonna take her to her house, and then he'll go back to his house, and she stops. She says her feet were worrying her, and she had a rock in her shoe. Do, they did not know that about maybe an hour earlier, a white woman had called the police and said that she had seen a black man near her husband's car and her husband went out and checked the car and saw that a gun was missing from his glove compartment. And so they call and say, our gun has been stolen from our glove compartment and we saw a black man nearby. So the police come by their house, pick up this couple, the, the Hoppers or the Hoopers, I think it's Hopper, and they said, do you think you'll recognize this black man? And she says, I think I will. And they said, get in the back seat of the car. And they get in the back seat of the car and they drive around and they come to the George Washington Carver Elementary School. You, those of a certain age will certainly know that was the African American Elementary School. And as they pull up on a hill, the lights go right on A.C. Hall and Eloise Franklin, and the white woman says, that's him there. A.C. Hall says, we got to run. And she says, I, why? I'm not running. And he says, we got to run. I, I got to run. We're going to run. Let's run. She says, no, I'm not running. And he starts to run. Police, one of them, without even getting out of his car, just starts shooting his gun. There is dispute as to whether or not they said halt or not. She says they never said it. They said they did. But one police officer didn't even wait to get out of his car and run. He just starts firing. In fact, he says later that the only reason he stopped firing was because the other police officer said, hey, man, I'm in your line of fire. Okay. They chase him, and he tries to get up A.C. Hall, and he lifts his hands up, and then he falls back, and he's dead. He didn't have a chance. It goes to a coroner for, uh, to a coroner's inquest of all white people, five white men, who are going to examine the cause of death. They are given a um, medical examiner report that says he was shot in the back. The police said, wait a second, at one point he was running toward us and, I mean, he was running from us and he turned around, we thought he had a gun, so we fired but the evidence was that he was not facing them, his back was to them. They couldn't find a gun, that, but during the coroner's inquest on the second day, the police show up with a gun. And there's this moment of relief. We finally found the gun that A.C. Hall stole, and they bring in the, the hoppers, and they said, okay, you'll be glad to know that we found your gun. Mr. Hopper looks at the gun. He says, that's not my gun. The, this all-white, coroner's jury decides after all this testimony they reach a conclusion that's very simple and very direct they said in our opinion this was murder but they have no law enforcement responsibility so they turned over their findings to a grand jury and a grand jury looked at it and decided that that wasn't the case and in Georgia, a police officer can sit inside of a grand jury, listen to all the testimony against himself, and then deliver the final statement. This is unheard of in, I think, maybe most states, at least 40 states. And, and he can deliver the last final benediction and cast the, the whole events in his, his own way. Um, we have, we've had one student working on this case and we will be teaching this. I got curious recently to go find A.C. Hall and find his gravesite, and I'm glad to say I was able to. 
the FBI said they couldn't find his family. I have, I have, I found his family, but they don't know. They've never heard of him. They were generations later, and the story of A.C. Hall is even lost in their own family. And here you can see his gravesite, born in 1945, died in 1962. And I don't know, it makes me feel better to tell you that he is buried next to his mama and to his grandparents. That's his mother next to him and his grandparents right behind him. Let me quickly tell you a little bit about James Brazier. This is a man who in 1958, he was a hard working man, worked three jobs. One of them was at the Chevrolet dealership. He, and, you know, James Brazier had one thing he really liked, and that was a nice new car. And because he worked at the Chevrolet dealership, he had access to a car, so he bought him a new car in 1956. His wife, by the way, worked also two jobs. And because of circumstances of, of records that we gathered later, we know how much money he was making. He was making well above average for African Americans and, and for many whites down in South Georgia, Terrell County. And um, so he bought himself a 1958 Chevrolet Impala. Uh, one Sunday afternoon, he's been in church all day. His daddy's been in church all day. James Brazier is driving kids and nephews and everybody back to their homes. He sees police have stopped his father. He gets out, he sees they're hitting his father and they, he doesn't know why, but he says, don't hit my dad, don't hit daddy no more. I'll get him in the car. Well, he crossed two lines there. One, he was driving a nice car, and two, he issued an imperative to the police. So they showed up at his house. They beat him up on the lawn. They took him to jail. A doctor, but this is sort of a subtext that we find many cases of medical neglect. A doctor came in, they saw blood in his nose, blood in his ears, slurring his speech. And he said, I think he's just drunk rather than understanding that clearly he had a skull fracture and sending him to the hospital. Um, the next day, uh, I, in the middle of the night, the same two police officers, and we know this because there were three eyewitnesses, one of whom we've spoken with, three, uh, poli uh, two poli same two police officers take him out of jail, and when they bring him back a couple of hours later, he's all but dead. His wife shows up the next day. She can't believe how the bad condition he's in. She takes him to a hospital the local hospital where she sees a doctor on the steps. She waves him over. She says, I need help, I need help, I need help. And this doctor comes over to her and looks in the car. And again, you have to pardon my language, but I'm giving you the language of the times. And she and the doctor looks in. She says, help, I need help. I need to get him into the emergency room. And the doctor says, ain't nothing ailing that nigger but drunk. And so she gets out and gets him up into the hospital. They take an x-ray. Doctor says, nothing we can do about this widow. He's still alive. She so takes him to Columbus Medical Center in Columbus, Georgia, but after five days, he dies. How do we know all this? One, we gather up a lot of documents. The FBI records, uh, this is, uh, I can't remember how many, this is 219 pages of FBI records. A lot of it is redacted, you know, blocked out. We get this through the Federal Freedom of Information Act. You'll see here, uh, that's, that's a redaction. That's what it looks like when the FBI blocks out stuff. And, there, and the students, and you, you, I, you, you'll sometimes have a chance to share this excitement when you are looking for something and looking for something and it's blocked out and nowhere can you find who the certain person is. And the students are all looking for this one particular witness who seems to have a better view of everything that happened in the jail that night than anybody else. And in classroom, a student will always blurt out, oh wait, they, ref they failed to block her name in one place. And sure enough, the name of this witness was at the bottom of this document, which is how we were able to find her and go interview her. We, you know, this is, one student found two to 3,000 pages of, of a court transcript related to a case, uh, to the James Brazier case. Um, just quickly, I want you to see this is James Brazier's gravesite. You might think I've got this perverse, you know, morbid curiosity about gravesites, but I do like to go there. I, I cannot tell you why. And we would never would have found this if his family hadn't taken us there, okay? Because when you look closely at his gravesite, you realize there's nothing to be seen, okay? And you might be able to do a rubbing and figure it out. Uh, that's not the way I plan to spend my life doing rubbings. Um, so the family took us there 
And as I say to the students, I mean, that's part, this sort of becomes our inspiration that we can't bring James Brazier back to life, but we can give his life meaning. Uh, and we are working on a plan to leave historical markers at these grave sites. In the course, we teach everything in the context of history. This is a history course. This is not just the who done it. In most cases, we know who done it. And if you ever want to know, well, why? And I think it's a reasonable question. People say, why are you going back and picking up cases that are 50 years old? You know, and I would say, first of all, I study history. That, why did I write my book? Why did I study news coverage of civil rights? You know, because that's history. But I'm also going to give you another reason. The one thing that all, that, you know, we, we, in this country, we're in, a disagree we're in disagreements about everything in this country, you know, and in Maine, they have a different idea about laws than they do in New Mexico. And in the state of Washington, they have different laws that are totally in conflict with the laws of South Carolina. I mean, that's the beauty of our 50 sovereign states is that they can all come up with their own laws governing their own people, okay? There certainly is the federal law hanging over all that, but each can, and on the death penalty, those are, you know, relevant matters. And on the issue of murder, though, that is almost entirely going to be a state matter. And every state gets to decide what it's, what the laws are regarding murder. And one thing that all states have agreed on is that there's no statute of limitations on murder. That no one in this country should, should be able to go to sleep at night having committed a murder sometime in their life and not worry that the next day someone was going to be able to arrest them for, the, for murder. So that's something that all states agree on. This is a law and order issue. Law and order people want to see justice brought to these cases. Uh, last thing I just want to tell you about Isaiah Nixon. He's a, he was a 28-year-old farmer in South Georgia, Middle Georgia, had six kids under 10 years old. Um, and I'm going to take you now to our website, coldcases.emory.edu. If you want to spend any time with it, just if you're curious about these cases. But we studied the case of Isaiah Nixon, a man who in 1948 was killed because he voted. Okay, and after he voted, uh, two men showed up at his, at his house and uh, said, did you vote? And he said, well, I did. And they said, who'd you vote for? And he says, well, I reckon I voted for Mr. Thompson. Well, first of all, they, they didn't want him to vote. Um, and they said, well, you're going to for, go for a ride with us because they beat up several people that day who had voted, African Americans. And he said, I don't want to go for a ride with you. And he backed up and they pulled out a gun. One of them actually had the gun out already and shot him three times and killed him. The next, he died the next day in a hospital after having told the whole story t to someone else. Um, so we've examined this case. The family very quickly fled uh, Austin, Montgomery County, Georgia. They buried him and they fled. They went to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, okay? They would come back periodically to visit the farm and to go to the cemetery, but they lost track of where he was buried. They left in a panic and they lost track of where, and over time his burial place was covered up. There was a headstone, but it had nothing on it, okay? But there was a slab of concrete that came off it over his body and it had gotten grown over with mud, dirt, leaves, trees, debris, and no one had been able to find his gravesite for 67 years. We found his daughter who had witnessed him being shot dead. We brought her up to Atlanta. She met with the students. They were mesmerized by her, and she um, said that they never, they could never find a gravesite. My students said, "We got to go. We're going down there." I said. Um, may I go with you? <laughs> I said, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for the gas. Um, and so they said, well, let's talk about it. Okay, he can go, you know. So we went down there and we're on the, we're at the cemetery and I just want to try to show you one quick little video. It doesn't take very long. Um, we go to the cemetery and we're just walking around. This man is showing us around the cemetery, an African-American man whose family was very involved in the narrative that we've been reading about on this case through the FBI records and other records. And he's going to show us, that's Mr. James Harris, he's going to show us his daddy's gravesite, okay? I found it. Found a thing that says Isaiah Nixon. 
Alright. So just one. Isaiah Nixon. And I was covered in mud, so now I'm covered in mud. There is an Isaiah that's, Nixon? Yeah. That's what I was... Because I saw something that said Isaiah, so I uncovered the date. It says September 10th, 1948. Wow. There's a big cement block. It was like on the edge of the woods. Okay, they look <laughs> what if you, what if Which is just, why I was what like, if, what, what is if, this? What if you just made a discovery, you know? Well, she had made a discovery. We had found the grave site. We called his daughter. We, You can see that his name was carved with a forefinger in wet cement or a stick back in 1948. We swept it all away. We cleaned it. We called his daughter. We showed her on FaceTime. She was just overwhelmed, okay? And then she came up just a couple of Fridays, uh, Mondays ago, she came up there. I've never seen a group of students as eager, persistent, to find everything that they could about my father. They were sincerely into it. I could see it from the very first time I met them in Atlanta at Emory University. Your faces will always be in my mind. When I heard the video that Hank sent, and then I heard, I found it, I found it. <laughs> it was amazing. They came here not to find Daddy's grave, but just to visit the site in which he was buried, and they found it. That just shows you what a group of students they are. And they're rare mm -hmm. to even want to to do this. I saw them all on their knees uh, trying to clear off and somebody saying, well, I found a bottle of water. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go get it and, and clear off and, and see. And thank you all. And the amount of information that you found, and I know you still have a lot to share with me is phenomenal. The whole thing to me is just surreal. It just is. And when you first called me, I had a lot, still had a lot of anger. And I think I told you all I did. But after talking to your group, some of that was released. And I want to let you know now, it's the anger is completely Go. released. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for that and, and so forth. I can just resolve this, it's been settled. And then looking at this, it's just unreal. I can't say anymore. <laughs> thank you. Except all that's coming in my mind is thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you for your attention. This is the purpose is to show that this history is within our reach, okay? And within our own lives. And I appreciate your uh, patience and allowing me to tell you the stories today. So thank you so much. <laughs> Now, Professor Robin Taylor will explain how we're going to handle our question and answers. So I'm sure that you guys have some, some questions. If you'd like to go ahead and come to the microphones here, and that's fine. If you're feeling a little more shy, you can tweet your questions with the hashtag RaceBeatTroy, and we'll take some of those too. So 
go ahead and start lining up if you've got questions. Um, we're going to start with, uh, we've got some student panelists. Jordan Elston is from Birmingham. She's a senior broadcast journalism major, and she's also the news director of the Trade Division. And Nakmo is the editor-in-chief of the Tripolitan. She's a senior multimedia journalism major from Vietnam. So, uh, Jordan, I think you want to have one first. So what do you think that current journalists need to do to start making the impact that they once did? Uh, probably exactly what you're doing here, which is learning how to do it, learning the basics, learning resources, um, learning everything from effective interviewing um, to, uh, I, I, you know, let me back up and say that there's a lifelong debate that goes on among journalists, sometimes involving alcohol. Um, about what's more important, the reporting or the writing, okay? And, you know, you could, uh, who's more important, the Beatles or Bob Dylan? Who's more, in, uh, you know, you can have these endless debates forever and they're great fun. But I resolve here and now that the reporting is more important. And I love to write. Oh my gosh, I love writing. I just, and I love great writing. But you cannot spackle over holes in the reporting with great writing though we do it all the time. So learning where things are. There's nothing to me, I mean, I guess in academia they call it research methods, I, I, I think, I don't know, but that's what journalists need to do is where can information be found? I'm sometimes surprised how few journal, uh, journalism students take advantage of archives, you know, where history is written. Um, so that would be the main thing is how to get information, how to use public information, be resourceful about that. Mm -hmm. Sir, would you like to go ahead? I uh, appreciate your lecture, sir. Very impressive. Uh, my name is Nelson Ball. I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. I've been doing some thinking about capitalism. I know it's Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi was larger uh, slave states, and they're also known for the production of cotton. So cotton required a large manpower. Now, my knowledge, I think that's where the slavery came in. So when Eli Whitley came up with the cotton gin, the cotton gin did more work in one hour and took 20 slaves all day. So my question is, did Abraham Lincoln free the slave, or did he not work free the slave? <laughs> that's a very good question. I, that's another thing to do. Always have another take on history, okay? Always be prepared to think of something different, to enter uh, a, a, an understood, well-accepted historical narrative and not just, it's not just a matter of challenging it, but turning it and looking at it from another angle. I think, um, I think that may be the case, but the uh, net result in some ways was, um, you know, you, you can examine how it turned out, but that's why so many African Americans left the South. That's why they moved to the cities. They were all part of the great migration that sort of came within decades after that. And, um, you know, Grover C. Hall St. Jr. used to say, guess what, folks, you know, you're not going to be treated any better up north than you are in the south. And no one, you know, liberals tended not to want to believe him because it just seemed like he was trying to just to deflect attention away from the problems of the south, which he was. But that doesn't mean there wasn't some truth to what he was saying about how that evolved and what that outcome was. Not sure if that was responsive, but that's sort of what comes to mind. I'll do a tweet, tweeted question. Um, this is from JoJo McBride. Is today's society mirroring times mentioned in the race beat, and are we currently defining real terrorism? Are we currently defining what? Real terrorism. Real terrorism. Or... I'm not sure. I, I'm sorry. I, well, let's I, go with the first part. Okay. Today's society mirroring times mentioned in the race beat. I, I assume she's. Um, talking about Ferguson and all of the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly there's an echo. I mean, the, it resonates. I mean, the same, I, you know, I look at the A.C. Hall case and, you know, it just, it's all, it's, it's the Chicago case all over again. Uh, was it McDonald, Laquanda, McDonald? I forget, I forget the last name, his last name. You know, there's so many similarities. Uh, we, we, we have not learned the lessons of history, or I, I, we, uh, enough of us haven't learned the lessons of history, okay? I mean, I think that the massive number of people that they're out of the whole mass of people, a lot of people have, and a lot of people are ashamed of what took place. I, I was, if I'd had more time, I was gonna show you a letter 
that I found by, written by a white woman, and this is in the archives of a black attorney, Donald Hollowell, and she's heard that he was representing James Brazier's wife in a, in a lawsuit, and she wrote a letter expressing deep remorse for the way her father, a police officer, had treated blacks, and he was white. And she, and she said, you know, I, you're a brave man to take on Mrs. Uh, Brazier's case. Um, I, I've never written a letter like this telling someone like you how proud I am that you're doing this, even though I'm a white woman and you're really uh, sort of fundamentally taking on the establishment that my father was a part of and the brutality that my father was a part of. But I want you to know that I admire you for that. And then she ends it by saying, this is the first time I've written a letter like this and I cannot reveal my name because I am a coward. But she came forth with it. And, and I think every day that someone else comes forward is a good day. Um, but I'm afraid that what we're having is positions hardening rather than softening in some areas. Grishma, you wanna go ahead? Hi, my name is Grishma, and my question is, what role do you see the media playing today in the coverage of race issues, and how is it impacting the society? Right. Well, I guess everyone sort of, I mean, you know, the, the race beat itself, news organizations have pretty much abandoned it. They really weren't covering issues of race or ethnicity. Now, they might say, oh, yes, but we were covering economic unfairness, we're covering this, that, and the other. And I would say not really. But more and more news organizations are covering it now. They've added the beat. NPR has a whole team doing this. Um, but I think until you tackle the underlying disparities, I mean, we would not know about the, I, I really don't like these words these days, microaggressions is the new word, right? You know, but of uh, uh, Ferguson and the, the nickel and diming of, of African Americans that the police were doing in Ferguson. And they're doing it in Atlanta. I went with my daughter on a traffic ticket. I shouldn't reveal this, you know. She'd be embarrassed. But, I mean, it's phenomenal how, you know, 2% of the people in this room who've had traffic accidents are white and 98% are black. And I don't, I'm not traffic accidents, speeding, and I don't believe it. I just, I don't believe that that's real, you know? And so I think that there are things that are straight in front of us that we ought to be looking at. We, the news, news media, which I am not a part of, but I certainly share, you know, the DNA. And, um, and we're not. And, I, and so I think that that's what Ferguson, when we peeled back what it was, it was the unfairness at the street level, at the court level, at all these little places where people are just being dangled forever in, in this, you know, inconclusive justice system. Um, that's where the that's where our eyes ought to be, in my opinion. So um, I'm aware that the reporting on the race beat by um, Southern journalists and Northern journalists was different during the Civil Rights Movement. Can you shed some light more on this, like how they were different? Well, yes. Um, I mean, well, first of all, what's really amazing is how many northern news organizations, what I grew up calling Yankee news organizations, um, use southern reporters as their eyes and ears. I mean, so many of these reporters, the first New York Times reporter, Johnny Popham was from Virginia. The second one, Claude Sitton, was from uh, Conyers, Georgia. Uh, you know, the UPI reporter, John Herbers, was from Mississippi. Cliff Sessions, UPI, was from Mississippi. Gene Roberts of the New York Times was from North Carolina. So many of the people who came down um, were, were Southern, but they represented Northern newspapers. But if they were with local newspapers, Southern papers, with some exceptions, uh, you know, I mean, some brave exceptions, including not far from here, Neil Davis up at, in uh, Lee County, uh, editor of the paper there, um, they tended to see things and report things through the prism of their childhood <laughs> and of their life, you know, and there was pressure. I came across a letter to a Newsweek reporter, jo uh, Joe Cumming, and his father was a very important, you know, a lawyer in Augusta, and they went back many, 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 many generations. One of them had been a, one of his family members had been, I think, if I'm recalling, a eulogist at Robert E. Lee's funeral. I mean, they were really, you know, and Joe was just writing what he saw, just writing what he saw, and his father sent him a note. You know, you might want to be careful about some of that language. Some of us here may think it's incendiary. And he was being fatherly. He was trying to help him. But my point is that that became subtle pressure 
on Joe to conform a little bit more to, um, you know, to the way his ancestors might have seen things. So they had to battle that. And that's the pressure that, J that Grover Cleveland, uh, uh, Grover C. Hall Jr. was under, I think. Northern Press that came down with some detachment. When I was based in Chicago for the Philadelphia Inquirer writing about the Midwest, I could cover those communities with some detachment knowing that my mothership was way back in Philadelphia. That my editor and my bosses, my publisher, they're not going to walk on the street and run into people who are bothered about stuff I wrote out of Chicago or, the, or Iowa or something like that. You know, it's a, there's a detachment there. Davis? Um, hi, my name is Davis. I was just wondering, what's been your inspiration to continue covering race relations? Well, I, you know, you don't always know that you have that. I mean, I, I was at the newspaper, I'd finished my book, I was trying to do, run a newsroom, and I got a call from a friend at the Center for Investigative Reporting. He says, I have all these reporters in the South who are doing these cold cases, and I need, so I'm out in San Francisco, I need someone in the South to help me manage these reporters, and we're gonna to try to raise a lot of money, and this, that, and the other. And I said, I can't, I've been, you know, I gotta get back to my job, gotta focus on it. But then when I left the newspaper a year, year and a half later, I thought, that's something I'd like to do. So that's when I got re-engaged on it, because um, I, it's just, I hate incompletion. I hate the inconclusiveness of these cases. I hate that families are walking around not knowing what happened to their daddy or their uncle or their granddaddy and not knowing why and that justice has not been served. And uh, none of us should feel good about the fact that, that I mean, that there's always going to be unfairness, okay? I mean, it's unfair when someone dies tragically in a car accident too young. I mean, there's, it's, these are horrible things. But these were willful acts for which no one was ever punished. And, and I just, it just offends my sense of justice, so. Um, well, we saw that Grover C. Hall went under pressure to conform around him. How do journalists today uh, sort of combat that pressure in order to maintain the integrity in their reporting? That's a good, good question. And, um, you know, I don't know how much of it is like peer is peer pressure in the sense that Grover Hall was facing that, or that even uh, you know Hazel Brown and Smith would have faced that. Um, I think the greater pressure is coming from working in organizations that aren't sure of and aren't confident in their long-term viability in the old models meaning the dead tree medium, meaning newspapers, meaning print, okay? And there's uncertainty there, and news organization leadership is very tentative and, and has been afraid to spend money. Now, I'm happy to say that news organizations that I thought were really, really pinching back four or five years ago are starting to loosen up. And I see them sending reporters to do things that are important uh, again, and they're spending a lot of money, a lot more news organizations are spending a lot more money on investigative reporting, which is fantastic. That's where the, the development of resources really comes important to know how to find things. Uh, so I'm glad to see that. But that still remains the number one pressure, I think, that, that editors face is, how far can they go in getting and broadening their coverage or deepening their coverage before someone over them says, wait a second, what do you think we are, a charity? We can't afford this. Um, that's, that's probably the greater, the greater pressure that goes on now. Um, there is, you know, you could hear an argument, you're gonna hate this. You're, yeah, there was, an, and I think we've all heard this in our generation that, you know, there was a time when journalists were poor, Sorry, were poor and didn't care. You know, they, it was not a high paying job uh, anywhere. And you've seen all the old movies and they drank too much and they smoked too much and they were yada yada, you know. And over time though, it started in the 60s and in the 70s, it became much, much viewed much more as a profession and news organizations were paying more for their people. And salaries really went up. And if you went into management, they went up even more because the news organizations were making 25, 30, 40 percent margin on, you know, so there was money to, to spend. Uh, and there are people who will say that that's, that that was the decline of news organizations' sense of urgency and sense of outrage about unfairness and about injustice because suddenly 
the reporters were in that upper, in that middle class and upper middle class that they had no longer been. I, that's just a discussion we used to have. I, I never felt I was in that upper middle class, I can say that. Uh, you know. So. Folks have tweeted the same thing, so I wanted to ask you. But they wanted to know where you, when you decided that you were going to tackle the race beat, what did you focus on first? How did you get started? And then what was the biggest obstacle that you had? Okay. Um, well, that's, that's actually a very good story. Good, very good question because there's a good story about it, and we all like a good story. Um, I did not have this idea for this book. Gene Roberts was the editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer when I was there, okay? I want to tell you about this man because he's an amazing man, okay? Gene comes out of North Carolina. He had been a reporter in, in uh, Raleigh, uh, first of all, a small newspaper in Goldsboro, then in Raleigh. He'd gone to the Virginian Pilot in Norfolk. He had gone to the Detroit Free Press, and he had covered some civil rights in the South. And then he gets hired by the New York Times, and they send him to Atlanta, and he becomes a reporter down in Atlanta. He becomes the national editor of the New York Times, and then he leaves to become editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer. And he's just one of the more unique people you'll ever get to meet if you have that good fortune. Um, and he, um, let me just first of all establish his bona fides. In his 17, in his 18 years as the editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, we won 17 Pulitzer Prizes. Okay? We won just about one a year for 18 years. Okay? Some years we won three, so which means we had some years we didn't win any. He was phenomenal because he trusted his reporters. He let them go, let them go deep. I'm also, I get emotional when I say, but his, his actual name is only on one Pulitzer, and that's the one that he and I share. Um, he always said that the one book that hadn't been written about civil rights was about news coverage of the civil rights, because he understood the impact, and he had done it, and he saw it. And he wanted to write that book, and when he left the Philadelphia Inquirer, he got the contract to do it. He worked on it when he was teaching at the University of Maryland, did it for about three years, and then he got the call from the editor of the New York Times, a good buddy of his, who was asking him, Joe Lelyveld was saying, I need your advice on how, who my next managing editor can be. You know, I've got this person, I don't think it's quite ready, this person, you know. And as they talked over weeks, finally Joe said, Gene, I think I need to bring you back to the New York Times and make you the, the, the managing editor, and you help me over the next three years develop who that person will be and then you have to retire at age 62, whatever. And at that point, Gene said, great. And then he said to his, to his agent, well, what am I gonna do about the book? And I had introduced him to the agent. The agent said, well, what about Hank? And Gene thought, well, that's not a bad idea. So Gene turned it over to me after three years, and I'm sure he thought that in the three years he was gonna be at the Times, I would knock it off. And so I did take those three years, and then three more after that. And then three more after that, you know, and it, 12 years all, in all, you know, after that. Um, but he pretty much let me run with it, you know. Uh, he had he, just interesting, he had given me two opening chapters he had written. One was Gunnar Murdahl, that's the book, one we went with, and the other was Jackie Robinson as the first running race story in America that the white press cared about, that, you know, that wasn't about some, some crime or something like that. And I read it and thought about it and then read, you know, An American Dilemma and ultimately concluded that that was the way to go, that that gave the book a spine that I didn't think the Jackie Robinson story would, would have the same sustaining power. Um, did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. okay. Whitney. Hi, my name is Whitney and uh, my question is, in your research and then in your own experience, how did you handle corruption within uh, journalism? Okay, what kind of corruption? Um, within either things that you found within your research um, for the book, um, or with you know just in general um, within your own experience. And when you say corruption, you mean like financial corruption? Um, or? Either um, just either journalists uh, taking advantage of of a situation or something of that sort. Right. Um, right. What, uh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. I th well, I mean. I mean, in my career, you face ethical dilemmas all the time, and you can make a really bad choice, and you can really hurt somebody. Uh, I teach a journalism ethics course, um, 
And, um, you know, I always played pretty, pretty close to the rules, you know, if, if not adamantly, strictly to the, and, and I lost stories as a result. You know, I don't, I really got into the thing where I just really couldn't stand for anything to be off the record and walked out of interviews rather than take something off the record. Um, or, or somebody wanted to undermine somebody else and deliver bad information, but then hide behind a tree. And I'm saying, you know, if the information stands on its own, well, okay, you know, you've got something, but if it depends on, you know, having someone explain it and be a voice, then you're gonna have to be public about it. Um, so, you know, I didn't, I mean, certainly there have been episodes. Look, when I, the newspaper that I went to when I was in Philadelphia, they had previously had, under the previous regime, under Walter Annenberg as a publisher, they had a, a reporter who was very ingenious. He was a great investigative reporter, built his reputation as an investigative reporter. He put people behind bars. And then one day he realized, I'm not making any money doing this. You know, they're not paying me more of every time I bust somebody. So he came up with this scheme and he went around investigating people and then he would go to them and ask them how much they'd pay him not to put it in the paper. And he literally did that. And he ultimately went to jail for that. Okay, you know, so. But generally, I'm gonna tell you, I, I feel fortunate. I've worked with the most honorable people, I think, on the face of the earth, in newsroom after newsroom after newsroom. People who just work their tails off, night after night after night, trying to get things right, calling people, you know, I'm sorry to bother you, you know, uh, but it's, I know it's late, but I've got this thing that says you did such and such, and I'm gonna really, and you're, you're not returning my calls from the office, and so I'm, you know, it's why I've tried to reach you at home, and I just, can we set up a time, can we meet, can you explain? People just working really, really hard, and, um, and honestly. Um, I want to go back on one question that I just thought about, thank you for that, about the difficulties in writing the book. A uh, part of this, I, this y'all will, I think, enjoy this. In the 12 years uh, that I worked on the race beat with Gene Roberts, we never had one email between us, okay? He did at one point have an assistant in Maryland and then I could email her and then she would tell him. But in the end, what it, we did was we talked on the phone all the time. He didn't use a computer. In fact, when he handed me, and Gene is used to being understood to be the Luddite, when he handed me the first two chapter, or the first chapter, the two versions, the, the words literally when he printed them out just ran right off the page. He didn't know how to set the margins, okay? And then he gives me tape recordings and he had had them on voice activated. So everything like that in Little Rock in 1957 and I went you know, and you couldn't understand a word. Fortunately, he had a daughter who he could dragoon into transcribing, but I had to go back and re-interview everyone. Um, he, when the, what the, he, there were two chapters in particular he really wanted to focus on, and I'm really glad he did Selma and The Times versus Sullivan. And he wrote what he wrote, he wrote longhand on, you know, yellow legal pad. Um, I'd ship him all my research, and he'd write it and send it back to me like this without a single footnote, you know, when I'd have to go and sort of retrieve sort of the, 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 the actual history of it, you know, so, but it was great. Uh, he was so supportive, so patient. Uh, he gave me the opportunity of a lifetime, so. And I might add that the editor at Knopf also did not use a computer. And I'd get these typewritten notes, I mean, it, and he was a real hunt and pecker, okay, and that, you know, hunt and peck the letters on a typewriter. And so you could hold up his, the sheet he'd written on and just see holes through it, you know, see the light come through. It looked like he'd been used at a firing range or something, you know, so. I'm sorry, I've delayed your question. Uh, you're fine. Um, people say there's a thousand and one reasons for an author to write their book. So with all the information... A thousand and one reasons for what? A uh, thousand and one reasons for an author to write a book. Yeah. So uh, with all the information and knowledge you spread and the people you've helped, what does the race beat mean to you personally? Um, I guess... Um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some glorified answer that it really isn't personal, it's professional. And then maybe if you, you know, if you're, if you have me on six minutes and you're making me cry, then finally I'll tell you what it means to me personally, because I would cry, you know. But, but what it means to me professional is an opportunity to open the door on a history that had importance and that really wasn't that well known. People sort of knew the surface story about the news media and the news coverage, but I think this gave me um, a front row seat on 
on a truth that um, hadn't really been revealed as fully. And I, you know, it, and, and it matters to this very day. It matters to this very day how we came to know what we know. Um, on a personal level, gosh, um, it was, as I said, the greatest opportunity I've ever had. And, and being able to do this, other than being able to raise my three daughters and be married to my wife, there's nothing that compares to it, you know. So I feel privileged. So thank you for your question. I think we have a, about time for two more. So let me do a tweet question and then uh, Jack, over to Jack. A um, couple of students have been, I guess, inspired by the cold case project. I want to know what kind of advice you might have to give someone who sees some kind of injustice and wants to start a project like that. What should, what should they do to get started? Um, well, I hope this, does, this doesn't contradict, but the first thing is trust your instincts. Trust your gut about something that you believe is unjust and to verify, <laughs> you know, um, don't go with your, with your hunch. You can, you can pursue your hunch, but you better prove the hunch and you need to get the basic framework right, which means the resources. You need to get the documentation. Um, and there's some things that you will never be able to prove, but there are even more things that you think you won't be able to prove that you will be able to prove, okay? I guarantee you, I don't, whatever this topic is, that within 10 miles of here, there's an answer in 25 attics or basements, okay? People have stories uh, that people who happen to be on the, such and such, you know, county commission back at a time when so and so, you know, was playing fast and loose with the contracting, you know, uh, who who has has a story to tell. Uh, but it's but the the most important thing is everything that you're learning in your classrooms about journalism and the and the purpose of the whole point of verification. Um, so th that's one. Two, um, you know, I think if you. It, it, I know one, I've either, I know some faculty members here and I know the reputation here and you got a great faculty that is open to hearing about these things okay and about giving you these kinds of opportunities um, I, I ours is a unique course I, I grant you that it's only done in two other schools law schools uh, there is a program at LSU but that's mostly it's a good program but they're mostly doing freedom of information requests to try to give to reporters um, so ours is unique, but there are equivalents that you can that you can work on. And I would pick I would pick a faculty member who shares your passion on that and, and try to sell it. Jack. Sure. Based upon the atrocities of the South and the problems that the Klan had in those atrocities, is there were there several atrocities committed in the North by clans up north? And if so, why is there such a focus on the South? Uh, well, yeah, I'm sure there were some terrible things that happened in the North, but um, you wouldn't find, the, the main difference is that in the South, it was institutionalized. In the South, the states passed laws that required white people to discriminate, okay? It wasn't just sort of, I'll turn the other cheek if they did. It was built into laws that people had to discriminate, okay? And that you violated the law if you didn't. You don't find that in the North. And I mean, I'm oversimplifying some of that, but, and it wasn't, and you didn't have uh, the, the state governments complicit in this. So that, I mean, you can put together, um, I mean, I, take James Brazier case, okay? And the police going after him, I mean, in no, he, he's beaten to death in April of 58. In November, some police officers had stopped him driving. And it, it happened over and over again. And he said, why are you stopping me? And they take him to jail and they beat him up there. And one of them says, you got a lot of nerve driving a car like that when we can't hardly live, okay? Well, just like a couple of months before, the attorney general of the state had given a speech 
eviscerating the NAACP as a corrupt group that was, mis you know, a, a real fiery speech. I mean, you had the leadership of the states in the South posing as defiance of the federal government and encouraging people to do anything they can. You had the governor of Georgia saying, the only, you know, if the, even if the Supreme Court, once the Supreme Court rules, as they have, that we must allow blacks to vote in our Democratic primary, there's only one way to stop them. And, and he wrote down on a piece of paper, a pistol. Okay, and Theodore Bilbo, who had been the governor of Mississippi and later United States Senator, Senator said flat out, you know, the only way to stop the Negro from voting is not at the polls, but the night before. So you had some real aggressive action going on in the South that was, you know, unlike anything that you would have seen in most of the North or the Midwest or the West. But not to say there weren't ser serious racism there when Pitchfork Ben Tillman of South Carolina would give these most racist speeches. If you, if you think our dialogue today is bad, oh my gosh, you go back and see what some of these people were saying back then on the floor of the United States Senate, including Theodore Bilbo. But Pitchfork Ben Tillman, he'd go speak to these Chautauqua organizations in the Midwest, and he'd, and he'd refer to blacks as the most, in the most animalistic terms. And he'd have five, six, eight, ten thousand 10,000 people, you know, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and you know various places across the Midwest. So I'm not saying that it's not a poison that has leached into the soil all across the nation, but it wasn't uh, driven by um, complicitous state leadership in the same way as it was in the South. Thank you. Thank you.